Tonight, we are fortunate to have uh, Chris Steiner with us. He's a PhD, he's a professor of art history and anthropology at Connecticut College. Um, also, one of his claims to fame is he wrote a chapter in um, Linda Klitsch's book. We had uh, Linda spoke to our club uh, going back, uh, I guess, a little bit more than a year ago. But the book on real photo postcards um, and, the, and wrote a chapter that's called, When You Look at This, Think of Me, Studio Portraits. And the book is the real photo postcards, pictures from a changing nation that Linda edited along with Benjamin Weiss from the Leonard Lauder collection. With that, I'll turn, uh, he's gonna talk about real photo, his collection of real photo postcards, which are mostly studio portraits and arcade props. So with that, Chris, um, take it away. Thank you, Michael. Um, and hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to be here. Gave me a good excuse to sort through postcards today and put together a PowerPoint. Um, it's a little daunting. I have like 15,000 um, and I had to, I can't show them all. <laughs> so I had, I had to make some selections, some tough choices. Um, I'm going to start the talk um, actually without, by not showing you a postcard. I'm showing you a carte de visite uh, to begin with, because in a way, my postcard collection is linked to my history of collecting these things. And I teach a course at Connecticut College called Secrecy and the Invisible, uh, which is a course in art history and anthropology, and it deals with sort of all aspects of how invisibility and secrecy have been dealt with in photography. And we do a whole section on these images called Hidden Mother, which some of you are probably familiar with, um, where mothers or, or studio assistants covered themselves in blankets uh, so that they could hold the baby still during a long exposure time. Um, and to us, I think they look a little weird and creepy. Um, but I was giving a talk on this for my class, and a week before, or actually the summer before as I was preparing, I got on eBay and thought, well, maybe I should see if I can buy one of these things and bring it in as a show and tell to class. And as luck would have it, not only did I find a really nice one that you see on the screen, but it was from a studio in New London, Connecticut, which is where Connecticut College is located. So I thought, oh, well, this, this is kind of meant to be. Um, so I bought the, this carte de visite and didn't really think much of it. And then for some reason, I got back on eBay a few days later and started looking at other stuff. And I found this postcard, um, which had nothing to do with secrecy or what I was teaching, but I just thought it was a captivating image of these two women sitting on a crescent moon. And I didn't really know much about them. Um, little, you know, sort of fast forward, I now have 1,200 of these paper moon um, images in my in my uh, collection. And for some reason, that was the first thing I became really enamored with and captivated by. And it's probably a good thing I did it in 2014, because if any of you have looked or collect paper moons, the price has gone out of control and they're extremely hard to find at shows or on eBay. Um, so the paper moon phenomenon really begins with tintypes, which I also collect. Um, going back to 1880s, late 19th century, uh, where you do find uh, paper moons um, subjects on tintypes. And then the postcards begin around 1904, 1905. This is the earliest one I have in my collection um, from an undivided back uh, postcard from St. Augustine, Florida. You can see the city gates um, in, in the painted backdrop uh, behind uh, this, this woman. And and this is from around the same time period in Old Orchard, Maine. Um, I could, I've only been able to identify those two studios for these really early ones. Um, and what's interesting is they both have this, I, well, I call them sort of a cutout moon, where the other person sits in a round cutout, and then behind them is a painted backdrop. Um, and that's something that changes over time once we get into past the 1907 period. So. Um, paper moons were extremely popular um, from, you know, sort of 1907 to 1915, I would say, is kind of the heyday. Uh, this is an ad for a studio in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania from 1914, uh, showing their paper moon, and the postcard on the right is from that same studio. Um, 
that's in my in my collection as well. Um, and I'll just show you some of the paper moons in my collection. They're you know they sort of range from from the mundane to the you know kind of really interesting. Um, and of course, that's these days I'm looking for the more interesting ones. Um, you know, I don't have a statistical analysis, but I would say 60% are probably children uh, versus adults, because uh, it was cute to have your kids on the moon. Um, I also look for ones with uh, uh, men and women in, in uniform, um, which you can see see in these in these um, this pairing. This is some of the more unusual ones. Um, <clears throat> the one on the left, I like the lettering at the bottom, hoo hoo, ha ha, uh, these women in, um, not sure what those are, cloth or paper bags, it looks like. And then on the right, um, other costumes. Um, you know, these are these are kind of the more unusual ones, which today I think would be really hard to find and would be expensive if you did find them. Um, I'm also interested in, you know, seeing how many people they can fit on a moon. Um, these are probably the mo the largest groups I've seen on, on a moon. Pretty, pretty impressive to get that size of group on there. Um, also, there are variations in the moons. Um, some of them are really unique. The one on the left with the Uncle Sam uh, motif and the one on the right with the devil. Um, definitely different than the, than the standard moons. There are quite a few moons where people are holding signs. Uh, the one on the left, uh, not married, but willing to be and wish I had a girl. Uh, the one on the left has called, caused a lot of questioning. People are not sure, do they mean married to each other or married to, to two women? I tend to think it's the latter personally, but there's been a lot of, dis lot of debate about what that actually means. Um, a lot of the, of the signage that you see on the moons are, are are popular songs from the period. So this one, Don't You See I'm Lonely, I think is just a variation of Can't You See I'm Lonely. Um, plus they misspelled the word lonely on the sign, which is not, not untypical. Um, you see a lot of misspellings on these things. This one won't be home till morning, both of them, which are also uh, from, from a popular song from that time period. And, you know, also looking for, um, diversity, African-American subjects, um, uh, non, no, sort of non-white sitters uh, sitting for their portraits. Uh, the one on the, the left of the twin girls is from a studio in Cleveland, um, the, um, which I have a whole, I have a whole series from his, his studio. Um, he was probably one of the better paper moon photographers out there. I've only found one um, Asian uh, subject, which is um, on on the left, which is from a San Francisco studio, and then on the one on the right are Plains Indians um, holding um, uh, beaded um, beaded bags, which is pretty pretty amazing uh, to to see that. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the recent film uh, called Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, there's a tiny scene in there where two uh, two people go to get their portrait taken at a paper moon studio, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. And they recreated this, this, they recreated the moon perfectly in the, in the representation. I like animals when I find them, either with people or two dogs on their own. And then I like when people are being contrarian and turning their back to the camera or looking at the sort of looking at the stars on the paper moon is always interesting. Although I've only seen these two, so they're hard, hard to find. Um, and then on the left um, is a um, um, what is it? It's a, not a not a Freemason, but Shriner. 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 Thank you, a Shriner. And then the one on the right sort of really interested me because I'll come back to that one in a second. But this is a soldier posing with a cardboard cutout advertisement of the Budweiser girl, and um, that kind of that one led led me in a different direction. And then I like when people are sort of in as many different possible positions on the moon as you can as you can imagine, um, lying down, sitting on it, rolling on it, et cetera. And occasionally the text is always interesting in the front or the back. I do like to read text on the back. Uh, this one on the left, I just thought was pretty funny um, where he he's indicated arrows denote exact spot where my socks should be. <laughs> 
Um, and the one on the right says, um, never afraid after dark, which I thought was pretty uh, poignant, uh, this portrait of these two women together. There are some advertisements that use Paper Moon, this one for Red Star Flower. And, you know, in terms of the time period, on real photo postcards, they go up to about the 1940s. This is one of the later ones that I have on the right. And then it switches to uh, direct positive prints from arcade studios, which you do see up until up until the 50s and 60s. Um, and then, then, it, then it kind of fizzles out. I did an exhibit in 2017. So this is sort of five years into my collecting. And I did an exhibit at the Lyman Allen Art Museum in New London, which is on the campus of Connecticut College, called It's Only a Paper Moon Souvenir Photography in America, 1870 to 1950. And the exhibit featured 500 um, photographs, of which the majority were the paper moons from my collection. And you can see, um, you can see them here uh, in the part of the installation. Uh, we did actually frame all 500. Um, my wife helped me. She said that she will never do that again as long as she lives. Um, so it was a it was a labor of love, but it was worth it um, ultimately because I think it brought in a really good attendance and students were involved in the curating and it was um, pretty exciting to do. We commissioned for the exhibition an actual paper moon prop. Um, there's a company in, in Los Angeles called the Paper Moon Shop, and I got in touch with them, and they made it exactly to my specifications, which is a, um, a, a reproduction of, of, a, of a specific moon that I had in one of the postcards. And visitors could pose on it, um, take their pictures, take their selfies, and, um, and post it on Instagram and so on. So that, that was kind of a cool, cool bonus to the show. Um, so to come back to this um, image of the Budweiser um, girl on the moon, I have several examples of it. And, you know, what, what interested me about this is this idea of sort of the levels of artificialness here that, you know, not only are they obviously not on the moon, the whole, that whole idea of sitting on the moon is, a, is an illusion, but on top of that, they're sitting next to a fake woman, which is kind of an illusion on an illusion. And in terms of, you know, sort of what I'm interested in, in terms of writing about and studying, I'm very interested in the relationship between illusion and reality. And I'm just gonna give you two quotes. I don't, I don't wanna go all professor on you, uh, but I'll give you two, uh, two quotes that I think are interesting and, and relate to the rest of my talk. Um, so this is from a book called The Real Thing by Miles Orville, um, who writes about the history of photography, among other things. And he says, in their fascination with the new medium of photography, its early practitioners luxuriated in the many diverse forms it might take, one moment celebrating its capacity for a seemingly literal imitation of reality, and the next its use as a vehicle for fantasy and illusion. And I think that's, you know, what's interesting to me in the postcodes I'm going to show you for the rest of the talk is that that relationship between the reality that photography was able to capture something real, and it's also interesting that they're called real photo postcards, um, and at the same time, people were just, you know, clamoring to pose with things that were fake in front of the camera, like the fake moon and, and the, fake saint, uh, the fake woman. Um, so that's the first quote. And the second quote is from a book uh, called The Image by Daniel Borstein. And he writes in this book from 1962, we risk being the first people in history to have been able to make their illusions so vivid, so persuasive, so realistic that they can live in them. We are the most illusioned people on earth. We dare not become disillusioned because our illusions are the very house in which we live. They are our news, our heroes, our adventure, our forms of art, our very experience. So again, this idea of living in in your illusions producing illusions the need that we have for creating fictions um, and i think we see them in the real photo postcard studio portraits and the arcade props and certainly that phenomenon continues to this day with instagram which is and you know and TikTok and facebook which is all about sort of creating an illusion of yourself uh, for 
for your friends or for your audience. So let's look at the different categories of fake things that are in these studio portraits. And we'll begin with the fake people, which is what I started out with because I got interested in that Budweiser girl. Um, there were many uh, portrait studios that had as part of their props uh, these standees or cardboard cutouts um, from advertisements. This one is, I mean, this again is an illusion on an illusion because they're posing in front of a painted backdrop of Niagara Falls and they're sitting next to a cardboard cutout of the Coca Cola uh, girl or one of many Coca Cola girls. Um, so I was able to track down which specific ad that that one is. This one's interesting because they took the cardboard cutout of the Coca-Cola ad and then changed the label, got rid of the Coca-Cola advertisement and changed it to we are doing Dixieland. These are uh, Coca-Cola cutouts uh, from, a, from a storefront on the right and then the photo studio took both of these cardboard cutouts and used them as uh, props uh, for people to pose with. And interesting that they're sort of posing between the, the women in exactly the same position that they're in in the, in the ad. And then this one is from a studio in Seattle, uh, the Joy Parlor uh, studio, where he's literally imitating the position of the male cardboard cutout as he sits you know, next to the woman cardboard cutout. And it's also interesting, and a lot of studios did this, they hid the Coca-Cola ad and stuck in their own advertisement. Probably breaking copyright, but there probably wasn't copyright in that in that time period. Um, and then this is uh, from a photographer in St. Augustine, uh, W.J. Harris. And you can see um, on the wide shot, you see sort of his whole postcard studio. Um, he had several different props that you could pose next to, a mule and, a, and an oxen. And then he has this cardboard cutout, which is of the Bromo Seltzer woman. And here you can see on the left, uh, someone posing in that outdoor studio with the Bromo Seltzer woman. And then the dog was apparently the dog that belonged to the studio and shows up in a lot of photographs. So you see the dog in the left with the Bromo Seltzer woman. And then the dog shows up on the in the right, which is another part of uh, W.J. Harris's studio in St. Augustine, where he had stuffed alligators, and you could pose with the stuffed alligators. And in this case, he's also holding the live dog, mind you, not stuffed. And we see the um, cardboard cutouts, again, being popular through the 1940s, World War II. Uh, these are some recruiting cutouts um, and a Kodak um, ad. Um, on both the left and, and the right is a Kodak ad from um, a Miami studio in 1943. That brought me to stuffed alligators, which is, as I said, uh, one of the other sort of fake things that was very popular, uh, primarily at Florida studios. Uh, these are some examples of different studios that had uh, the, the, um, the, the alligators. You know, what's interesting is if you go back to the, the paper moons, I mean, part of my long-term project is to try to identify specific moons to see if, because since most of them don't have the, the studio identified on the back, if I can identify the moon and be able to sort of group them by moon, maybe sort of begin to put a landscape of where 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 moons were located in different studios. And the same can be done with the, with the alligators because there weren't that many and they're, you know, they're stuffed in very specific positions and you can sort of track out which studio had which position, um, which positions on their stuffed alligators uh, to see uh, what studio might be involved. Um, I always like cards that, again, have different examples of illusion on, you know, illusion on top of illusion, the card on the card on the right where they're driving a fake car and about to run over a fake alligator in a studio with a fake palm tree backdrop. So that's got a lot of, lot of fakeness, which is what I always look for. Um, the idea of shooting alligators, um, although sometimes it looks like they're pointing the gun, the rifle more at the women than the alligator was, was a popular thing to do. And then on the right is a later one, probably from the 
30s or 40s um, hand, hand tinted uh, from a, a Miami studio. And then this is 1920s, that same Miami studio. Um, I like this studio. It's really convenient. He always put the the location and the year in every studio shot. So it makes it really easy to identify, identify when it was taken and where it was taken. And then this last one uh, from the Alligator series, um, again, shows this combination of fake women with the stuffed alligators and then on the right a fake boat in Miami with a soldier, a Navy um, guy shooting the fake alligator. Um, which brings me to fake boats, which is another big category. And, you know, one of the things I like looking for in the fake boats is kind of the spectrum from realistic to not realistic. So on the right is a really well done boat with perspectives, uh, perspective and a great interesting backdrop with sailboats and a, and a, um, a town in the background. And then on the left, a uh, pretty folksy folk art painting, um, almost of a, of a boat. And I kind of like that that whole range of things that were that were obviously done by by real amateurs, um, folk paintings, and then those that were done by more um, trained artists. I mean, some of them have actual sort of real kinetic energy to them. The one on the right really is well done. Looks like it's literally about to pop out of that postcard. Um, towards the viewer. Um, there are a range of boat types, sort of rowboats, canoes. I was able to find a few examples of that. And then people doing interesting things in boats, like having pouring himself a glass of, of wine or something. And this carries through the boat, interest in boats carries through uh, to World War II as well, uh, with the, uh, where the, you know, it becomes the, the submarine chasers and the one on the left going after U-boats. So it's, it's kind of interesting how all of these different props, you know, start out with one, with one function, but then adapt to the current circumstances and the backgrounds change, the, the, the words on the boat change and the, the symbolism changes depending on historic circumstances. Fake airplanes is a huge category. And here you see one type of the fake airplane. So this is really the simplest kind that was there, that which was just a painted backdrop with a wooden contra contraption that was either mounted to the floor or mounted somehow to the to the wall, which is what it looks like on the right. And the customer would sit in the in the wooden contraption and pretend to steer to steer the plane. The um, Studios could either make their own version of this, but there were also commercially available uh, props. This is one that was sold by a company in New York, Ruff and Caldwell, around 1910, where you could buy the painted backdrop with the mountain scene, and then you could buy the wooden airplane that uh, looks, I think it's, if not identical, very similar to the one that the uh, Atlantic City studio has on, on the left. And I don't know what the conversion rate is for $35 in 1910, but I suspect that's quite a bit of money back then that, that they had to invest. Probably the most elaborate airplane prop that I've that I have or that I've seen is from a studio in Portland, Oregon, uh, run by a man named Cal Calvert. And he started uh the the, the this he started he, he built the prop for the Rose Festival in 1907 in Portland, and he not only built this elaborate flying machine I think is more what you'd call it than an airplane, and he put it on top of a three dimensional diorama of Portland, um, which is pretty phenomenal that he you know that, that he built this is extremely realistic looking, um, and. If you you know if you collect these things, the the only ones from 1907 are the ones that say Rose Festival on that flag uh, that's on the the one on the right. After 1907, he changed it to the Rose City. Um, so all subsequent ones say Rose City. It's only the original 1907 ones, which are hard to find, that say Rose Festival. Um, I also like when people are misbehaving um, in front of props or with props that they're not following the rules. And I think you find you find a lot of that out there that people were 
we're we're you know kind of messing around. So this guy hanging on to the outside of the airplane in Long Beach, and the man on the right posing in front of it. I wouldn't say he's misbehaving, but it's just actually more interesting to me that he's posing in front of it rather than in it, because you can sort of see how it was constructed. And some some of these are pretty simple. I mean, this is just a piece of painted canvas stretched out, and he would have. If he was doing it properly, he would have been standing on the other side, so it looked like he was flying the plane. Some um, There's also a whole other set of um, airplane studio props where it's more of a photo montage. So they were taking a photograph of people in, in an actual three-dimensional plane, not necessarily a, a functioning plane, but the shell of a plane. And then they would, in the printing process, print that on top of a stock negative of wherever the studio was located. So the one on the right is again W. J. Harris, the guy with the with the fake with the Bromo Seltzer woman, and the alligators. And here they are flying over St. Augustine. And the one on the left is from Fort Myers, Florida. Um, I was fortunate recently to find. Um, Oh wait, that's the next slide. Sorry, this is just another example. A lot of times they were flying on over the beach because these things would have been set up on the beach, the the the, the planes they were posing on. Um, and then the one on the right is from the Los Angeles Air Show, which is actually a really well done photo montage. Um, what I found recently was a snapshot from Long Beach from 1912 that shows the prop plane that they were that they would have been posing on so you can see these people are standing in front of this uh, plane and if you look you can see on the little enlargement at the bottom left you can see there's a little wooden ladder there that they would have climbed up on sat for their photo and then um, and then that would have been printed on top of a stock negative of the pier um, in Long Beach um, so I was really happy to be able to to find that that image that contextualizes how how these were actually done, um, fake and real automobiles. There were uh, two types of automobiles that people posed in. Uh, this is uh, the the sort of the cardboard cutout, or actually probably a painted wooden cutout of the of the facade of a of a um, of an automobile. This is from a photographer, Floyd Edward Quick, in Bel Air, Ohio. Although he was traveling uh, throughout the country. And you can see the outside of his studio on the left um, advertising uh, the photographs on, on postcards. And if you look closely, you can see inside there's um, there are people on that on a car. And then the image on the right is that exact car from his um, from his studio, although not not the exact pic picture he was taking at that time. That would have been that would have been too great to find. Um, and then people posed in real cars as well. Um, so this is from a Toronto studio on the left, have your picture taken in the automobile. And on the right is an example of that. So, you know, the, just, you know, to me, I mean, a lot, lot of these things I think are, they're about illusion, but they're also about um, people wanting to participate in modernity, right? But, you know, they wanted to be part of, of modern technology and they could be in an airplane, they could be in an automobile, even though none of them I'm sure had ever been in a real airplane and very few probably had been in a real automobile and probably didn't own an automobile. Um, so it's a way of kind of creating an illusion, creating um, a, 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 an aspirational desire to be part of a, of a modern world that they may not quite have had, had access to in reality yet. Um, again, I really like the ones where they're so badly done that they're good. Um, that this kind of folk folk art um, one, especially on the left, that um, doesn't look anything like 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 a real car, but they seem very pleased to be posing in it nonetheless. And then there's a studio in Denver, a couple of studios in Denver, that had a an interesting car, but then they have even more interesting slogans that they put on the front of the car. Um, the one on the left to the madhouse and the one on the right, life is one damn thing after another. Um, and I have collected about 20 different uh, slogans. So I don't even know how many they had, but they had at least 20. 
Um, and you know, I like to I like to say that this is like hashtags before there were hashtags that you could put you could put a sign on the car to state whatever you wanted to state you know, since uh, before social media. And then again, the more unusual ones where someone's pretending to be hit by the fake car, and then the one on the right where they added streaks and and added the effect of wind going through their hats uh, to look like they're actually moving. Um, those are much less common than the other ones, but I think they're always exciting to find. And here you have the same car that presumably was driven from fair to fair across um, whatever region um, it was in. So you, it's, it gives you a sense that, you know, that it's it's the same car and it's being multi-purposed at carnivals and at fairs for different people in different communities to sit in. And again, like all the others, I'm always trying to find diverse subjects um, in, in, in the props, um, Native American on the left and African American on the right. Um, <clears throat> So we have we have all modes of transportation. Um, so fake hot air balloons, another big category. Um, and here too, you have kind of the the really simple ones, which were just painted backdrops with an opening cut into it, um, where uh, people could stand, um, and always identifying sort of the location where they were flying from and to, um, or where they were. This you know Lake or Orion on the the left. Um, I was happy to find this um, outside of a photo studio where you can see the advertisement, not only for your photo on a postcard finished in five minutes, but on the right, talking specifically about your photo in the balloon on a postcard over your own city. And, you know, what, what these photo studio operators would do is either have a stock aerial view of the city or arrange to get an aerial view of the city. They would show up at the state fair, the county fair, and take people's pictures. And just like the airplane, they would photo montage them onto an aerial view, or not even always an aerial view. The one on, I don't think the, the two on the right are, look like they're just taken at street level. Um, so you could, you know, I think what, what was exciting for people is that they could be photographed in their own city in these fake hot air balloons. Um, and give it kind of a, a real local, local flavor, local meaning. Fake trains were popular. And again, I was happy to find a um, Coney Islands uh, Luna Park uh, photo from 1910, uh, where you see the whole set of what this studio had available on the left, a painted backdrop of a kind of um, bucolic landscape in the middle, a train and on the right, a steamboat. Um, and I do have on the, the postcard on the right is taken inside that Luna special train. So you can sort of see what the prop looked like and then see what the final effect would be when people had their picture taken in it. And same with this from Omaha, Nebraska, the Krug Park or Krug Park. Um, on the left, you can see <coughs> kind of they wide angled out and on the right what the actual prop would be. And you kind of wish that people had taken more of these wide angle shots that show the whole studio, but they're few and far between. Uh, people, a lot of the train props were located at near train stations, obviously, and people had their photograph taken when they were leaving and when they were arriving. Um, so you see sort of both with these destinations and this is was a popular a popular thing to do and then have your postcard and you could send it back home if you were uh, traveling. And the phenomenon goes until, as far as I can tell, the 1940s and then pretty much fizzles out. So these are some of the later examples I have from 1945, 1947 in, um, in California, Los Angeles. Um, fake animals or and taxidermy animals. So you find both people posing with taxidermy. And, you know, there, I guess there are two examples of people posing with taxidermy. One is more sort of taxidermy as a trophy of hunting, which is not what I'm that interested in. The other is taxidermy where they're posing with something that is made to appear like a live animal, which is, I think, what's going on with that buck on the left. And then um, cardboard, uh, wooden cutouts, painted cutouts of animals like the elk. Um, on, on the right. 
a lot of times the animals were specific to the location. So if you were visiting Catalina Island for the day, you could have your, po your photo taken with a, with a painted seal. Um, if you were at the Bronx Zoo, you could have your picture taken with a, with a lion. If you were at the National Stock Show, you could have your picture taken on a cow. And I'm not sure where you'd have to be to have your picture taken with a funny looking elephant, but that was, um, that was a, a, elephants were popular as well. And then fish were popular. And of course, people posed with real fish in studio portraits. I'm mostly interested in people posing with fake fish and especially the one on the left is is really fake looking which is which is great for me fake orange groves were popular in california this is uh, there were several studios in la the one on the left is from pasadena and the slogan i'll eat oranges for you you throw snowballs for me was very popular where you would send this back to your family and friends on the east coast uh, to show them that you were eating oranges in the dead of winter, which of course would be, was impossible at that time today. I don't think anyone would really think much of it, but at that time there were no oranges in the dead of winter in on the East Coast. Um, and in order to achieve that, rather than pose in an actual orange grove, you would go to this photo studio and pick fake oranges off a fake tree, which is what, what they're doing in this um, in these photos. We already saw one fake Niagara Falls. Um, you know, the when when people went to Niagara Falls in, you know, in at the early period of the history of photography, it was impractical to take their picture outside because of lighting, because of uh, conditions. So they built studios with painted backdrops of Niagara Falls in which you could pose. But the phenomenon continues well into the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and even 50s. Uh, when it wasn't about a technical limitation, I think it was just uh, just a practical solution to get your picture taken. Um, so the earliest ones, like the like the paper moons, uh, were on tin types, uh, which I have in my collection. And then you move into real photo postcards, 1910, 1912, um, in which they're posing in very, probably very similar, if not the same studios, uh, but just using a different format of, uh, of photograph. And what's interesting is, you know, again, this idea of messing with the prop, uh, this was something that I'm sure they were instructed to do because there are way too many of these for people to just have done this on their own. Um, this particular studio had a metal bucket and I think the sitters were told you could hold the metal bucket and pretend you're collecting the water that's coming off the painted backdrop as a kind of amusing gesture to do while you're having your portrait taken. You know, again, turning your back to the camera and looking at the backdrop, which I think is fantastic. And then I'm not sure what's going on on the right with this woman and a, a toy monkey of some sort. But um, again, just showing there's like, you know, there's the run of the mill ones, and then there are the more eclectic and more unusual ones, which are harder to find. Um, posing in cowboy attire, I consider to be kind of an arcade prop. Uh, this is the same studio that had that paper moon that I showed you at the beginning um, in Harrisburg, and they, you know, they sort of spell out what they have available, cowboy and cowgirl uh, costumes, riding the moon, etc. So you could put on these woolly chaps or a cowgirl outfit and pose for your portrait um, as a way of emulating um, cowboys. And my, you know, what I actually wrote about this in my chapter in the MFA exhibit, where I have this theory that it's, you know, it's it's one way for people as as America is becoming more urbanized in this time period. It's one way for people to recapture the spirit of of America and the Wild West. And I think they saw this as being really, you know, really uh, uh, quintessential American identity. And particularly if you had immigrants coming from abroad in urban centers, I have a feeling a lot of them were posing in the embrace America and what they thought of America at the time. Here you have sort of the fake cowboy with the fake horse and the fake train on the left. So multiple layers of fakeness. Um, a big category, and I'm getting to the end, because I'd like to have questions too. Um, a big category of what I collect are 
what are called comic foregrounds, and I'm sure many of you have seen these. Uh, these are um, where you stick your head either in a hole or on top of a painted um, canvas or wooden uh, board. And what's interesting about the comic postcards, of which I have many, because I really consider them to be a great example of this blending of reality and illusion, uh, they were invented in um, in the late 19th century by a man named Cassius Coolidge, who was known as Cash, and you probably know him as the guy that painted uh, the dogs playing poker, um, which is what he was much more famous for. But he did patent in 1874, before he got into the dogs playing poker, he patented the process for taking comic foregrounds. And this is the illustration that went with that patent uh, from 1874, where the sitter's holding a caricature body of a man, in this case, uh, fishing, and that would have been done on a tin type. Um, so he's holding this, it's really thick paper in this case, um, with this painted image. Um, these were available commercially to studios through several companies, one called Ingento, one called Robico, and you could, the studio could order, you know, about a dozen or more different uh, different uh, scenes, different uh, caricatures, and give um, studio uh, people uh, people studio clients a choice of what to what to uh, sit with. And one one theory I have about these is, you know, one I think it's all about making money. So you know, once someone's had their standard portrait taken, well, what are you going to do for me next? Oh, well, come back and have a comic foreground taken. Come back and have. Um, Pose in the fake airplane, or so. I, so I think all of these things were ways to create lures for people to come back and have more pictures taken at photo studios. Um, so here you see these are larger than than the ones that were used in those tin types. These are full body, really. I like these two just because one on the left says the real thing, the one on the right, the real thing here, and of course neither of them are the real thing. So I like that that contradiction. You could mark your travels for where you went by the, the 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 text seeing toledo seeing los angeles some are really hyper specific so the one on the left is from 1906 uh, the national association of master plumbers um, had their own uh, souvenir um, comic foreground and the one on the right is an ad for edison light bulbs um, so you know so these are these are associated with either products or events. So pretty limited run. And then some just unusual ones of someone in the mouth of a whale or shark, not sure what it is, and one uh, flying, rough riding on the planes. And then I'm always interested in ones, again, where they're messing around with the prop and switching genders. Um, so you know, this idea of kind of play acting playing gender gender performance performing gender if you will um, with these um, comic foregrounds is I think really interesting and then I like the ones where they didn't have enough people so they have one um, headless person in the middle or when there were too many to fit on the prop which is great because you can actually see sort of the sort of how the sausage was made as it were um, of the, the the way the way that the, the studio was set up and then this is a uh, one I have many examples of. It was a prop you know, from Long Beach, California, out on the pier, very popular place for photo studios and arcade studios. And the slogan is on our ass in Long Beach. And I was able to find an actual uh, prop um, on the right uh, from the 1940s uh, from a, a, a dealer in, in California. So we now, we now have this hanging in our house, much to my wife's chagrin. Um, and then <clears throat> lastly, this is, is kind of a, it's a variation on the idea of illusion and reality, but I think it gets into trick photography, which is something I'm also really interested in. Uh, these are these five-way mirrors or multigraphs where a person would sit um, in a chair facing two mirrors that were at, at an angle and the final product makes it look like there are five people having a conversation with each other. Uh, what I think is so fascinating about these is if you look at the one on the right, the ad on the right uh, from Rossman's uh, in Brooklyn, 
it's the slogan was see yourself as others see you and that was that was sort of the marketing device that you could you know by seeing all angles of your face both from front behind and side it was giving you a glimpse of what you really looked like to other people um and they, they, they it was sort of touted as like the ultimate portrait that you could have five five views of yourself in one one image um the one of the biggest studios that did this was in Atlantic City Myers Cope and you can see on the postcard on the right the outside of Myers Cope and it's probably a little hard to see but below it it says we originated the five-way mirror I think is what it says and there's a photograph of it and that this was probably half my collection of these are from Myers Cope they were obviously doing a brisk business in five-way mirrors and you know again always looking for the unusual ones where they're holding something here he's holding a photograph of a child um that's the only African-American example I have on the right. And then, of course, even more unusual, a uh, bulldog and aviator glasses and a woman playing a quintet with herself um, on the on five uh, violins. Um, I was, um, I, I, for my class in the history of photography, we actually built one of these uh, for the students. And it's a it's deceptively simple. Um, it's two huge mirrors at a 72 degree angle, a triangle table that I covered in red felt. And when you sit at it and take the photograph from behind, um, you end up with something like the image of me on on the right. So I was really happy that I figured out how to do this. And now three different classes of students have experienced it. Um, probably the only time they'll ever know what a five-way trick mirror a photograph is. So to end, I'll just say, if you want more, more of this kind of stuff on studio portraits, um, have a look at my article in the Real Photo Postcards book. Um, the book is really more, it's, it's not my collection, obviously, it's the Lauder collection, and it deals more with, with studio portraiture rather than the arcades and props, which is not something the exhibit focused on, but something that I'm personally interested in. And if you're on Instagram, I post a lot of these kind of images almost every day um, on uh, my Instagram account, which is at paper moon man, all one word. And with that, I will thank you and stop sharing my screen and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, that was very good, very interesting. There must be questions. The, you showed two of them, but a cute little boy with a flower sack. And I'm happy to tell you that that is a, uh, a little boy that belonged, obviously, to uh, the man who owned the flour mill that was here in Wichita, Kansas. And oh. I have two of them. So I well, no, you have two of them. That's what I uh, look like. They were different, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a neat advertising thing and uh, just love it and have really loved your program. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad to know that that's the boy that belonged to the family. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering about the exhibition. And I noticed there was the one room with two enlarged cards and then the swath of hundreds of cards. And I'm wondering uh, what you got from your students on this and what your experience was with the difference of seeing enormous amounts of photographs like the Lauder collection, as a matter of fact, because the show at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts was uh, extremely dense with a lot of cards. And uh, and I was thinking, walking in that room with that moon, with those two large photographs, I thought would have been a very different experience. And I was wondering what your experience and perhaps your students' experience might have been if 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 that's relevant to you. Yeah, no, that's a great a great question. So I think I mean the first thing I would say is, um, I mean one one of the challenges as you as you as you know for for exhibiting real photo postcards or any postcards is by putting them in 500 frames 
we were kind of setting each one off as a work of art, as it were, rather than, you know, its original function as a postcard. So I think that's a very different way of, it, of seeing it on a, in a frame on the wall rather than flat, um, you know, maybe in a case. So that was one one issue. Um, I kind of liked the idea of, of walking into this room that was absolutely overwhelming with images. It almost created a, you know, like a cabinet of curiosities effect. And I had seen, I had seen an exhibit, um, I think two or three years earlier at the new museum. Um, and I can't remember the title of the, of the exhibit, but it was a, a, a artist who collected only photographs of people posing with teddy bears. And she must have had two or three thousand of these. And the That's new the museum, Toronto woman. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and the, the the installation, I mean, was phenomenal at the new museum where they actually created a walking platform around the second level so that it was floor to ceiling and the ceilings were, you know, 30, 20, 30 feet high, um, packed just just frame to frame. So that's that's kind of where I got the inspiration for the installation. Um, of course, I didn't think about the fact that the new museum has staffs of dozens of people and we have me and my wife and a couple of kids who didn't know what they were doing, but um, <laughs> that made it challenging. But I, you know, so, so, you know, to answer your question, I think, I think the students enjoyed seeing it in that format and a lot of people did. And there was a guide where you could actually look at each one and identify it where, rather than have labels on the wall. And then we enlarged those other ones huge, just so you could really see detail on, I think there were actually five or six in that room when you were posing on the paper moon. And the, and the ones that we enlarged, people were posing in different costumes. So there was one with a feather boa, one with a top hat, one with a, with a straw hat. And then we had uh, in that room, a suitcase filled with feather boas and straw hats and top hats and people could actually put those on when they posed on the moon. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think for the, the students got a lot out of it and they certainly learned, they certainly learned how to hang a show because when you're trying to hang 500 um, frames, um, the, 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 the way we actually did it ultimately is because it would have been impossible to hang 500 individual frames. They were all on a piece of painted plywood that was laid out in a grid and the frames were actually glued to the plywood and then the whole plywood sheet was put on the walls so it was a what so, happened afterwards so i mean uh, i had to i had to i had to take them all off and destroy every frame and put them off to get my postcards out oh my god but luckily they're if you ever need good cheap frames they come from michael's art supply store and i think they ended up being about two dollars each which was which was great. <laughs> Chris, does this translate into a fascination with Coney Island art and culture too? That type of yeah, interest? yeah. I mean, so many of my cards are from Coney Island. Is that is that an area you collect? Well, it's the art, the um, everything that was offered in that kind of environment is fascinating. The um, specifically with me, it's automatic musical instruments and carousels. But mm -hmm. I'm just interested in all of that. Also, uh, Michael, are you going to put this on YouTube for us? Yes, it will be. Yes, and you'll send me an. Uh, There'll be a link on our website. Well, get it up. Okay. All right. There's Thank you. All the meetings on the website. The other, the other thing I should <clears throat> add is sort of before I got involved in any of this, even before that hidden mother photograph that I bought, um, you know, I've been teaching at Connecticut College since 1997. Um, I haven't been doing postcards or photography for all of that time. Uh, but one of the areas I've taught for many years was the history of um, sort of the representation of others. And I do a whole section on freaks and freak shows. And I always assign Robert Bogdan's work on freak shows which, you know, that sort of led me to, to his work on postcards, which I hadn't known. Um, I hadn't known that he, he did postcards as well. So I've, you know, become friends with, with Bob over, over in the last 10 years. And I would say that that was another avenue that brought me into postcards and the Coney Island scene and, and all of that sort of carnival stuff. 
when I find them at shows or on the internet, I collect um, exterior views of the observation deck and the restaurant at the Empire State Building from the 30s and 40s and 50s. And I find some similarities there. You know, people pose for photos, they're family groups of different shapes, they're soldiers or they're um, friends or, you know, uh, parents and children. So there's a there's just a real authenticity to them. You know, they're not, these people aren't actors, but they're, you know, they're relaxed and they're, they're there enjoying themselves. Yeah. It's not like the earlier earlier photos where people had to remain, you know, stiff with a a rod in their back or something, you know, for for long exposure. Yeah, no, I I really like that aspect of it, the the humanity that you see. Um, I think the idea of, of that they're all souvenirs too, um, that they're they're sort of ways to remember an event, um, which is you know again my earlier work before I got into this was on. Uh, my dissertation was on African art and the souvenir market. So I'm really interested in souvenirs and, and the way people create memories and preserve memories, um, which is why I love the, that, the, the title of my chapter in the MFA book, uh, When You Look at This, Think of Me, was actually written on the back of one of the postcards. And I thought that's exactly what these things are about. It's when you look at this, think of me. Thank you. Chris, I have another... Go ahead, go ahead. How far is that college and its museum from the New London train station? <laughs> um, it's a it's a five minute drive, but un unfortunately, the show closed in two thousand seventeen. Well, there's still a museum there. Oh yeah, the museum's still there. They have they have um, good shows up right now, and I'm I'm doing another show in twenty twenty six. Um, in the museum uh, called the, the, the Photography and the Painted Image. And that'll have both painted backdrops, photographs that were painted, and some of those comic foregrounds. I was really impressed with the, all the uh, supporting ephemera that you had that showed, you know, the photographers or the ads for the things. How did you ever search for those things? Um, the ads um, were, I, I subscribed to this uh, service called newspapers.com. Oh, okay. And and I, I don't, I mean, it took a lot of search words to figure oh. out how to find them. But yeah, I was thrilled to find, I've never seen an ad for a Paper Moon studio other than the one I showed you. So. That was fascinating. Thank you. Chris, Ashley Aaron's in Arkansas. I'm a member of this club. Um, loved your talk. It was fascinating and so fun, just so fun. Um, and you answered a question that I've I've had, and it's about a postcard that I have of a mother um, posing when what looks like a real car, but it's a tent behind her um, with her baby. And so I thought to myself, is that a really a car that they had in the studio? And and sure enough, it was. And so that's real interesting. But it didn't even try to have any kind of a painted scene behind it. It was just the tent <laughs> behind her. Um, so that answered that question for me. And then also, I just wanted to tell you, and maybe you've seen these in your research, that in Arkansas, a, a big tourist town then and, and still now is Hot Springs, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And there was a studio there um, called, it was an amusement park called Happy Hollow. And part of the amusement park was to have various of these um, photos like you're describing. And so they're just, I see those quite a bit here in Arkansas. There, people are on a mule or they're on a wagon being pulled by a mule. They had stuffed alligators. They had people drinking, you know, at a bar. It had really, they really did a good job with that because it was a big tourist town. So um, I was going to see if you had any in your examples, but I'm sure there's examples from all over the country. But Happy Hollow, they they did a good job. Oh, yeah. Here in Arkansas. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I have a I have a huge number of the Happy Hollow ones. Oh, and there, there was a studio called Too Cute Studio. Um, and they actually did great double exposures where it looked like someone was shaking their own hand or pushing themselves in a wheelbarrow. I've seen some of those. Yeah. yeah some Very of those. clever. Very yeah. Clever. Thank you. Of course, the, the, the holy grail of the Happy Hollow cards is Babe Ruth used to su summer there. Yes, he there, did. There are photos of him posing on comic foregrounds, but that's yes. that's beyond those are, my... Those are in private collections now worth a lot of money, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Do you know the work of the photographer Jerry Yulesman? Yeah. I, I kind of I wonder looking at these I was wondering if over <clears throat> over the years he he looked at a lot of these postcards 
if they had an influence on his work yeah i mean he's he's definitely the master of illusion and reality right yeah. so yeah yeah that's interesting no he's definitely someone that i that i like precisely for that element of of trick and mm -hmm. and photo montage actually that raises another question for me and that is uh, as a teacher of photo history uh if you have observed or maybe intuited any sense of relationship between the quote normal history of photography, which tends to focus on fine art photography and the Yulesmans and the Westons and Cindy Shermans and so on and so forth of, of the world, the relationship between the uh, them and photo postcards, uh, what cards they might have seen, if there was any interplay, or I'm, I, I find cards are sometimes as interesting or more interesting than the touted um, ones in big collections. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's, it would be interesting to know who who collected what. Um, I'm sure somebody's done research. Well, on Evans it. did. This, yeah. yeah, yeah. Stuff Walk, there was an exhibit at, Met, at the Metropolitan Museum a few years ago in Walker Evans. Yeah, yeah. And of course, Stephen Shore sort of, emulated the photo chrome postcards in the 70s that was kind of his 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 art art at that time did he but draw also walker them? evans had talked about i mean about how the, the detroit's influenced his work mm -hmm. and just going for the clean look so it all comes back to postcards that's how a lot of photographers got their starts or they were working and needed money and would sell them to Mitchell or to Detroit and doing things like that. So yeah. I mean the you know the other the other the other side to that is as someone who teaches a course on the history of photography is you know the course is you know I half of the course is the great masters, if you will. But the other half is vernacular everyday photography and postcards and photo postcards is a big part of that. So we actually had last, I taught the course last semester and we had a very generous donor who allowed us to invite um, a, a collector in residence and a scholar in residence. So we had a, a, a collection from a collector named Natalie Curley who had a collection of American um, vernacular postcards mostly. Um, and then we had uh, Lucy Sant, who wrote a book on folk photography about real photo postcards, and she came in as a scholar in residence. So, this, so the students are getting a, you know, unbeknownst to them, they're getting a very different history of photography than they would in a traditional course. But luckily, my 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 department allows me to do that. Where do you teach? At uh, Connecticut College in New London. Okay. Well, Chris, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a thank great time. That was very, very, very good. Very good. Really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Enjoyed giving it. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.